Today's episode is brought to you by Apprentice Academy. Apprentice Academy is my audio production and engineering school based out of the West Barn in Nashville, Tennessee. We have a 16-week program that puts you in the driver's seat, totally immersed in the studio, learning techniques, learning um, technology, learning everything we talk about here on the podcast, which is how to get in a room and stay in a room, the, um, all the nuances of the music business. We love this program. It's a great time. We'd love to talk to you more about it. Hit us up at apprenticeacademy.net. There's a lot of information there as well as a contact. We have a 2021 fall semester starting the last week of August. We also provide virtual classes. So if you can't come to Nashville and participate with us, we've got a great virtual program as well. Reach out. We'd love to talk to you at apprenticeacademy.net. Hey, it's Joe West from the West Farm with Mike Shimshack. Today, we've got mastering engineer Andy Van Dett. He's worked on such on records with the Beastie Boys, David Bowie, Whitney Houston, Uncle Cracker, Rush, Deep Purple, Porcupine Tree, Seven Dust, Big Wreck, Dream Theater, and Devon. Devon? Oh, man, I, I misspelled it. What's the last name? Townsend. Townsend. Okay, my, I got spell, I got uh, a mistype here. Uh, he was the chief engineer of the infamous Master Disc. Uh, in New York City for 14 years. He's now a senior mastering engineer at the Engine Room, as well as Andy Vandette Mastering. Um, one, a dear friend of mine. I've known him for a lot of years. And uh, the way we met is actually a great story um, that I probably have told on the podcast before, but I was working on a record in Pittsburgh and um, a producer had flown in to steal that record from me. And I was so excited that this guy deemed it worthy to be stolen that I um, ended up sort of following him around like a puppy and asking, asking him, him questions and drove him in and out of the airport and just was so thirsty to, to have somebody, a big timer come in like that. His name was Ron St. Germain. He had done the tool record, which was just all the rage at that point and a bunch of other records, Living Keller and whatnot. Uh, but he turned me on to Andy Van Dett and Andy Van Dett ended up mastering that record that I had done and uh, ended up mastering a ton of records with Andy. Uh, and he is one of my favorite guys on the planet. Please welcome to the show, Andy Van. Hello, also, everyone. also a Western New Yorker, by the way. Oh yeah, that's true. Are you yeah, from Rochester or Buffalo? Uh, well, bu- a suburb of Buffalo, Williamsville area. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I remember Joe sending me this letter saying. You know, I really want to get in the industry. And Ron St. Germain said that, you know, maybe you'd have some wisdom. And I, I will always remember because the wisdom I gave you was don't. Was it? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I didn't hear that. Son, there, were, there, were, there were two people that, that sent me, you know, that same kind of excited letter. And I told them both the same thing. Dude, if you can do anything else. <laughs> You should do something else. Do you like the idea of retiring someday? Do you that like is so funny that you say that because my recollection you- was I did not hear that. I was not <laughs> willing not. to hear that. <laughs> what I heard was moved to New York City. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did probably say, yeah, Pittsburgh. Uh, okay, after you're done recording your friends and former schoolmates, uh, who, who, who are you going to record? You should really get your ass to New York. Well, I tell you what, I did a lot of records from Pittsburgh with you. The Seventh House record I did with you that was on Atlantic. I did the Gathering Field record, which is also on Atlantic. And sort of, you know, every time I had a, something for people to master, it was going up to Andy Van Dett. And you were a great mentor to me. You answered a lot of questions. I was very curious about New York and you were a guy in New York. So you were very kind to me. Um, and you were, as a mastering engineer, you were very attentive. It was always about like what does it take to make you guys happy? Right. So it was like, we would come back with notes and you would be like, it wasn't like we were ever hurting your feelings. You know, a lot of guys, when you give them notes, you can see this wash of like despair come over their face, you know, like you just, you know, ruin them. You were not one of those guys. And it was like, okay, we're going to just chase this record down. We're going to chase it down until you guys are happy, you know? And, and, and I noticed that, you know, uh, it was okay. You were always sending us a reference and we got an idea on a record kind of got locked in and then you would go do it like that. Right. So we do a song and then you would continue on with the record. And it was just a really great process, especially for people who didn't, you had a lot of pros working with you. We weren't pros in the sense that we knew how to just, 
manufacture and do records quickly. So you're very patient with us, which I thought was really good. In an award like today, I could see that being a really, really great asset. A lot of people need, need let along. Well, you know, I would say that those, that, that's the growing part of my clientele is, you know, it, it's great to get, get, uh, get records from great engineers, great producers, great mixers, major labels, all that. It's, it's all great. But in between those moments, I'm working with a, with a ton of indies and, you know, a, a lot of, you know, the, the engineers that, that stick with me are the ones that, that want feedback there. And there are a lot of engineers that are like, uh, you want me to turn off L2? No way, man. L2 is, is it's my sound of my sound. I, I can't turn it off. I'm like, dude, if you like it with L2, imagine what it's going to sound like when I'm done with it. Uh, and, and I've, you know, I've gotten some serious pushback from less intelligent engineers and generally, you know, those aren't the people that are going to come back and work with me again. Uh, so you know, it, it is those those engineers that are that are working through uh, recording schools like I did, and mm -hmm. that get out and they're like, "Wow, I I don't have the opportunity to the Andy Van Det had Andy Van Det had the opportunity to sit behind multiple industry luminaries and uh, steal their workflow." Bob and, Ludwig, Tony Dossi, sure. Greg Calby, who else? Howie Weinberg. Um, and yeah. I got to spend some time with Vlado Meller, mm. uh, Leon Zervos came through, you know, a lot of engineers came through MasterDisc and, you know, some of them had some very different ideas on, on, uh, how they attain a sound that would make a client happy. Yeah. And I noticed that about you. It's like when we first started working together, you were taking over Tony's room at nighttime. You didn't right. have your own room at Master Disc. So we would right. work out of Tony's room. He was very kind to you and, and oh, really, you know, oh, wasn't one of those relationships where he was trying to like push you off into the corner. He was always trying to lift you up. Yeah, uh, no, Tony, you know, Tony and I still have a still still are in contact. And, you know, he would help me with, with the vinyl cutting as I was learning vinyl cutting. And I would help him with like the digital workstation aspect mm -hmm. of, of mastering at the time. Because that was coming online at that point. Yeah. So, you know, we had a great symbiotic relationship and he would show up in the morning and i'd be like oh you're here already oh uh, uh, I, I, I just gotta print this one more song please 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 and so yeah so you know him letting me use his studio is really the incentive for then the studio saying yeah we will upgrade your editing suite to full mastering capacity you know no one today remembers what a big freaking deal digital editing was before every laptop could could handle that 150k right. per second cd data rate you know now title does that online but you know back then that data transfer rate was like wow how it was a dark art and all these old school guys were like what do we i don't want to learn that you know it just wasn't <laughs> natural for them right. but you right. are, you are in essence kind of like everyone that listens to this podcast is on the verge of like hey like I was coming out of Pittsburgh. It's like, I've got a little, I know what I'm doing here in my little room, right? I've been building wood shedding, but I don't know how I compare to the rest of the world. I don't right. know if when I get there, if I'm going to be any good or if I'm just going to get blown away. You know, you got to show up. You showed up at a place, got to study under a bunch of guys and eventually worked yourself in your room. That back room that you had was not a back room. It was a, probably one of the nicest mastering suites at Master Disc, in my opinion. It sounded great. It was large. It had, you know, you had this massive, what are they, Altec speakers in there? Yeah, Altec I mean, teens, voice of a the beautiful theater. old yeah. Neumann console, you know, with NTP compressors and Sontec stuff. I mean, it was a beautiful room that you had there. It was like, it was good to see you, even though I was watching from underneath, you know, you were uh, much more, you know, higher up the ladder than me watching that happen it was like okay this guy went from borrowing this other guy's room and making copies to like being able to study underneath all of these guys and now he's got his own thing it was kind of a really vindic for me watching that it was vindicating because i was like oh i can do that maybe i can do that in these in the studio world you know it, it is possible to just work hard rise up under people take all the good information you can and then go on and be somebody you know it was a it's a cool thing to see it happen that way. Well, it, it is the way it used to happen. I mean, you got to spend time with it is the way. Ramon, right? I, a day, uh, 
three days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, still, I mean, three days is more than any kid coming out of the, you know, the recording schools is going to get today. And, right. you know, there were other people, sure, that you got to hang out oh, yeah. with, maybe pick up some shit. And if you're, if you're attentive, you know, I have to say, I started off as intern at the studio. And after being chief engineer for 14 years, I have to say, I was not a really good intern. I was not a really, I, it was, I kind of my internship as doing time. I was getting school credits. It was expected of me. And the entire time I, I was not, I would say, seizing the opportunity. I was doing everything they said and I was asking them if I could do more, but it really didn't have, an internship didn't really have much to do with mastering. It had more to do with sticking me in a tape library and having me release tapes and, you know, at, at, at that time, you know, with Bob Ludwig, Howie Weinberg, Tony Doffy, all working at that studio, uh, even that was like pretty, pretty amazing. Oh, my God, look at this, this, this tape from this obscure Canadian band that I am their number one fan of, yeah. uh, you know, so but but I didn't really take advantage of making sure that uh, I got into the studios and hung out as much um, as I should have. And, you know, today uh, I've seen a whole host of interns come and go and, you know, you, you kind of get a feel for, yeah, this kid, this kid gets it. And so when you say you, are, you weren't a good intern. No, I mean, I, mean I, I, I answered the phone. I ordered lunch. I was fully competent. Yeah, but that. you're saying you didn't put in the time afterwards to stick around and, and work creatively? Not, not a lot. Huh. Not a lot. I would How say do you attribute your success then? Just being able uh, to scale and say, hey, they don't know digital. I'm going to be the digital guy here. I'm going to be the say, tape guy here. Um, I would say that I had seen enough other engineers kind of rise up the company ladder. So I knew how it was done, but it really wasn't until the, the manager of the studio said, Andy, you know, you can come in and work eight hours a day and go home. You can do that. But, you know, if you ever want to be an engineer, you better start getting your ass in the studios. And so I think I'd been there probably hired uh, a year and a half before I started hanging out with uh, Bob Ludwig's night guy who taught me the, all That's that a great idea. to know of cutting vinyl and right. how to read Bob Ludwig's notes. At that time, we had just mastered uh, a record, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Born in the USA. And if you looked at the record. card with Bob Ludwig's notes, <laughs> you would see that every engineer on staff, except me, of course, had cut a set of masters to send oh, to, wow. the, to a vinyl manufacturer somewhere in the world. Um, and so, you know, then that became my, my goal was to be able to read the notes. What a brilliant uh, little idea. It's because it's like these guys work all day and then their guys would work all night making the parts for the record. Yeah, 1630s well, well, and doing all this data stuff, right? Well, there so was like, the 1630s until the end of my internship. Oh, okay. But, you know, that so, kind of work, that kind of work, busy work, yeah. printing, printing whatever it is, to half-inch masters, printing, you know, doing vinyl, doing whatever. So many parts that used to live in, in the mastering world. I remember you'd leave a session and you'd see the invoice would be like CD master, $95 <laughs> for a CD, you know, 1630 and quarter, half inch and all this stuff. You're like, wow, I just thought I came here to master. And it was like 20 pages long, but it's so cool that like all you really need to know is the nighttime work. Cause then you become sort of like an ex you become competent enough to be able to facilitate that stuff. And then eventually work your way into the room where you're doing it. Sure. I mean, I, I had started off doing a lot of digital editing, uh, CD master assembly. You know, I was I started during that the end of the vinyl heyday and the beginning of the vinyl explosion. And at the beginning of the vinyl explosion, like I said, digital editing, you needed a one hundred thousand dollar gear uh, uh, rig mm -hmm. to be able to accomplish that. And it probably never would have happened other than Bruce Springsteen's engineer said, hey, I have this Sony 1630 digital editing rig and we don't have anywhere to put it. If you guys store it for us, you can use it oh until we need it. So it gave me, they put it in a storeroom and I started doing digital editing uh, and all kinds of copy work for the CD explosion. And, uh, you know, by, and 
pretty quickly after that learned how to cut vinyl records. And so uh, the studio was great in that you had Howie Weinberg's clientele, Bob Ludwig's clientele, Tony Dossie's clientele, and I would get to hear all of it. Yeah. And, you know, rate it or. And it's like, it's, that's the beginning of good at that point for you. So you couldn't deliver masters that wasn't at the bottom of their work. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you're, you should always hang out with people who are better than you because then you could be the worst, (laughs) best person. Right. I mean, that's sort of the, sort of the concept. Get rid of the people that, you know, that aren't inspiring you or pushing you, you know, keep them as friends, but don't (laughs) chase them professionally. So I, I got a question for Andy. Did you, ever do the route previous to going to master disc did you ever do were you a mixing engineer were you a recording engineer first or did you just go straight into mastering i was you know a student at an audio school and i really had zero interest in mastering um but in the uh, october of 1983 i would have gone to see bob ludwig during the audio engineering society convention and I wanted to do an internship at his multi-track studio. He was part owner of a studio called Boogie Hotel in Port Jefferson, Long Island. It had been owned by the, the band Fog Hat, and they weren't doing so much, so they, so they sold it. And um, it just happened to be three towns away from my then college girlfriend. And so, you know, talk about being led through life by your gonads. I thought, yes, I'm going to do my internship at the studio. And I went to see Bob. And if you know Bob, I I had never met anyone like Bob Ludwig. Uh, I I visited him during an unattended session. And we had, you know, a really nice conversation. And so here's Bob talking to me. He's he's got tandem lathes. So he's, he's cutting two lacquers at a time, making changes on the console, uh, while taking phone calls, while talking to me. And, and all the while he had this like focus. And uh, at the end of our conversation, he said, but Andy, how come you don't want to do your internship here? And I was just so like taken aback <laughs> that, oh my God, Bob Ludwig wants me in the tape library. He can't work this without is, you. <laughs> this is so awesome. And so I arranged uh, a two studio uh, internship where Monday through Friday, I would be at, at master disc. And on the weekends, I was supposed to be at the boogie hotel. The boogie hotel thing never really happened. And I actually have no idea what's going on in that, in that space now, but uh, at the time they either didn't have the sessions or when they did have the sessions, they kind of lacked the um, what's great about being a studio in Manhattan in the mid eighties is that, Studer had an office there open 24 hours a day. Uh, Neve had an office there, you know, and you could get tech support 24 seven. Well, Port Jefferson, Long Island, you could not get that kind of tech support. If you did have a problem, you had a problem. Um, And so, you know, I think for that reason, it just, it it never clicked there. And by the end of summer, I was thinking mastering Fuck that shit, man. They only give you stereo, two tracks, left and right. No, man, I am a musician. I was born to sit behind the knee. I was born to program the flying faders. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the summer, I was kind of, you know, disillusioned, went back to my, my college to complete my degree. And I thought uh, Jingle Studio. Jingle Studio, that's that's where I want to be. There were enough other students that had come back and had experiences doing internships at Jingle Studios, and they were telling these stories about, yeah, you know, I showed up and uh, the vocalist was sick. So the producer said, why don't you get out there and do something in front of the microphone? It's just for the demo. And what do you know? The client liked it. So now I'm getting these residual checks residual checks i am all about residual checks. <laughs> that's what i thought and uh, and when i got to new york i i did end up uh hooking up with the with the jingle producer and you know we did 150 store chains across the united states and we had some pitches for some major uh products across the united states uh and at the end of it was Samba, the taste of Brazil. And it was, uh, 
a new beverage being broken by the guy who brought America, uh, I'm sorry, Arizona iced tea had just broken big. And so this was his next big find. And unlike a lot of the other musical things that we had done, uh, pitches, we actually, the, the producer had the contract for the spot. Mm. So rather than, um, I think we had done one for TGI Fridays and, you know, we had done one that was kind of poppy, kind of Jerry Seinfeld theme ish. And they had gone for the one that was more like Michael Bolton, America. Okay. You know, we, we pitched it, but this one, we actually had it and, you know, very high energy. We did the spot six months goes by and I contact the producer and he says, Oh, Andy, I can't tell you how horrible this gig went. Well, it turns out there's like 57 different types of Sambas and the <laughs> client didn't like the Samba that he had picked. So right off the back, he re-recorded -re ah. uh, the entire music bed. And uh, long story short, uh, the product test marketed so poorly in the United States that they just yanked the whole campaign. This is where you're like two faders. That's all I need. Two faders. <laughs> right. I'll compress it. I'll EQ it. Put it on vital. We'll be done. It's funny how we get where we get, you know, it's like, it seems like a fairly random path, but it isn't that random when you look back at it. It's like, you were always supposed to be a mastering engineer. I mean, you're, well, you know, yeah, you know, you, it, 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 your it sure sensibility, your personality. You're also one of the greatest fans I've ever met as a mastering engineer. You legitimately love music. I can't tell you the amount of times I would call you. You'd be like, I'm going out to see a band tonight. I went out with you a couple of times. I remember we were right. down in the meatpacking district in some warehouse watching a rock band that you had done. You know, you legitimately are a fan of the music, <laughs> which and it shows in your work. It shows in your care. It's like, oh, these creators, I want to make sure they're happy. That's something that you can't really, you can't force that on somebody. They got to see the value in that. And you obviously see the value in it. When you're making a record now, talk to me about like your process. Like how do you get a record started? Let's say somebody who is a first time person working with you. Like when you're, is it like, hey, give me a song. I'm going to give you some options, right? Is it, hey, send me the rough mix so I can hear how much limiting's on it. Tell me how that, how you get yourself into a workflow with a client. Hmm. You know, it, it, it varies greatly. Um, but generally I will just let them send me what they're going to send me and I'm going to save my reaction um, for after I hear it, because in order to master a record, somebody thought that that mix was worthy. Mm -hmm. And so um, somebody thinks it's good. So until I actually do hear something that's like egregiously uh, bad, um, you know, generally I have the idea that I have my name on enough bad sounding records. So now that we're in a, in a world where chances are somebody has access to the mix. Uh, now that I know that chances are, no, you're not, hang, uh, not going to have to hire uh, the same engineer to book time in the same studio to do a recall that might not be as good as the original. You know, now that the guitarist has it on his laptop, um, I can lay the simple wisdom on them. Cause usually there's like one or two things that are going to make the mix unlistenable. And so I can call them up and I can kind of feel them out as far as, okay, is, is this uh, a mix that's set in stone or is this a mix that, um, you might be able to, you know, things like, why is the vocal so much brighter than the snare? Why is the snare so much brighter than the vocal? You know, these kinds of like really simple fundamental things. Um, I find I have lots of tools that can uh, EQ uh, top end and I can spread that stereo image from New York to L.A., I can do all kinds of things, but if you've messed up that basic building block of how the bass instrument interacts with the kick instrument, um, that's a tough one to fix. Yeah. So, uh, you know, feeling out the client, if, if they love the mix, the thing that I have flagged as a, wow, that's kind of weird. Um, sometimes clients are like, yeah, it's weird. I love it. Oh, okay. You know, this is a new way to hear music. It's a new angle. 
that's an okay. interesting decision to say that because <laughs> we're also committed to say, hey, this is wrong. But now you're like, wait a minute, let me readjust my impression of what's wrong. Well, you know, I'm trying to hear it like you. Am I too old school that I'm trying to jam the round peg into the square hole? That's a great point. That's a great um, point. And there are so many. Uh, uh, I, I got to work with a, a band called U2. And while we had some downtime. Uh, <laughs> Never heard of them. It was the bass player, the drummer. He was. He, he said, you know, it, it, it's so hard for us to record music because there are so many ways you can hear music and we need to explore them all. You know, it, it's great if you have that option. Um, and it, it, it's great to have, you know, the kind of tools what did you, and what did you resources. Respond? That this, by the way, coming from a guy who used to have tape to the side of his converters, uh, people want to hear noise. <laughs> Is that what was on there? <laughs> Do you remember this? Yeah, on the, on, the, on the meter, on the Sony digital meter. Was it people like uh, noise? What was it? People want to hear noise. People want to hear noise. <laughs> what was, was your response? I, I had said it. One of my you should have just said, we're going to put client, a bunch of noise in client. it. Don't worry. I, it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, not, uh, not every recording needs to be clean and pristine. Right. It, uh, it's well, I think that's a great that... point when you're saying like, hey, maybe I need to entertain the idea of hearing music differently. Even though I've created a career 30 years of doing one thing, like that's confidence. We've talked, I think it was Elliot Shiner. We we're talking to a, a pretty legendary dude. And we were, we had made comment that it's like having the ability to go ahead and like fearlessly hear anything that someone says and say, I don't know, let's figure it out. Let's try it. Maybe it was Frank Filippetti. But it, like it shows confidence in your skills because it's like, I don't have to keep making the pie that I make. I can make whatever pie you imagine. You're not afraid to do that. You understand what I'm saying here, right? It's not like, hey, it has to be in my wheelhouse where I don't do it. You're willing to say, let's entertain the impossible. Like what the bass player from U2 was saying is like, let's entertain the abstract concept of this album and let's just figure it out. That shows a lot of confidence. A guy who will do that has a I lot think of confidence. To be, to be successful, you really have to continually reinvent yourself. I see mm. a, a lot of engineers that really want to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And uh, that is workflow. That is your method. But, you know, with, with there are, there are so, there's so much gear coming out every day. There's so many plugins coming out every day. And to just try to push yourself constantly to, to check out stuff and, and, and tweak your workflow and learning to listen to your clients. I am not the mastering engineer that's like, we are going to do it this way. Um, yeah. I have, I, I'm ready to lead. I'm ready, to, but I'm also ready to follow. Um, that's and that's so a killer when, point. Uh, when John Spencer, John Spencer's blues explosion came in and uh, I uh, kind of think how many years I'd been in my mastering studio by then, not many. And, and he, he said, but Andy, how come you don't use, all the compressors at the same time. And I said, huh, you know what? Let's try it. You know, <laughs> pushing them all in and, and, you know, the light went on, he loved it. And, uh, you know, there was no singular compressor that was sucking the life out of anything. Yeah. Um, but just multiple stages of, uh, every compressor that I had, uh, on that recording. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think that's the ticket, man. A lot of people hear what they want to hear. Like, I didn't hear to stay out of the music business. You know? <laughs> it just was like, I don't even remember you saying that to me. But if people can hear one thing, it's like, hey, it's like, be ready to lead, but be be willing to follow. Yes. You know, because there's a great record out there that isn't in your mind. I feel like I'm bored with what's in my mind. You know, it's like, I don't want to make the same good sounding record I know I can make all the time. It's like, what if we made a record that we just imagined we didn't know what it was going to be? It's like writing a song. You don't know what it is until it is, until it enters the room. So it's like, I really, 
would encourage people. I don't, I know that I, at certain times you're incapable of hearing things, but if you're willing to lead and willing to follow, it shows that you know your skill set. It shows that you've got a passion to explore unknown things and get things that are unique. That's what people want to hear is things they haven't heard before. I mean, these are all the, the telltale signs of being able to evolve and change and become something that you weren't yesterday. You know, these are all the secrets of being the secrets of being successful and being able to do what it is that you got into the room for what you went to school for. That's like the sliver in our lives, maybe 30% of our lives. The other 70% is this other stuff, which is like, why do I, why do I want to work with Andy Van Dett? Oh, because he's interested, interested in me and my music. And I know that he's going to fight with me to get the record that we don't know what it is yet, but we're going to find it. You know, it's like, that's like being in a foxhole with someone. Um, I just think that's, that's the true secret of the music business. You know, all these other, it's what's missing from the internet too, by the way, right? <laughs> Truly missing. You know, you watch yeah. a, a guy sitting down behind a workstation doing this thing where he's dividing vocals across a hundred tracks, the same vocal and hitting one with every frequency with a different, what, and then you listen to the final thing. You're like, yeah, it's people aren't going to hire you for, hire you for that. They're going to hire you because you're easy to be around and you're a good guy. And that whenever you bring the faders up, it moves them. You know, it's like you got to have the tech chops. You've got to be good. But the reality is people want to work with people that will dream with them. That feels like, hey, he just joined the band. I always felt like that when we made records together. I feel like I could call you up good and point. say, hey, we got to redo this. And you'd be like, just give it a shot. It's a very good point. Yeah, that's an intangible thing that that is really understated, not mentioned, not valued, not on the marquee of these internet videos or conversations, but it is truly when we talk to all these guys, it's the secret. The secret of you being successful is you EQing 80 Hertz into something. It's the experience of working with you and knowing that I bought into you as a creator and you've bought into me and we're going to do something special here. So that's my rant. I'm sticking with Very that good. rant. Very good. Um, I was, I also, I, I was admiring, uh, I was admiring earlier, I, Andy and I had made a record for my band years ago with our friend Jeff Reed Miller. And uh, he, I saw his speakers there, the, the Meyer HD ones. I remember distinctly seeing those in Andy's room. I remember them very clearly. And so funny to see he's still, still rocking them. I love it. Since awesome. 1986. Yeah. Uh, was when I, when do I they got still the make them? Oh, yeah. Do they still make those? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Uh, and I would say since... Since then, uh, probably in the mid early '90s, every speaker manufacturer created their own HD one. You know, the same mm -hmm. kind of specs: an eight-inch woofer, bi-amped, built into the speaker, uh, sixty-five watt a side or more. Um, but a lot of them have uh, knobs in the back to help you tailor them to the space. The one thing I notice about the HD ones is there's no controls. To tailor them to the space <laughs> you don't need it right. hmm. uh i did start out at home with uh m audio bx8s yeah kind of the same thing you know mm -hmm. and they definitely had the uh the knobs in the back and when i brought the hd ones home and had them side by side i couldn't really make the the bx8 sound like the hd ones right. um, what else what other speakers are you using other than the hd ones when you're mastering um at at engine room they have griffin a, a set of uh custom griffin speakers that were designed specifically for that space with uh far fields yeah and uh 15 inch sub on each side um but uh, you know much smaller than the uh altex and and by the time i had had left master disc i i always knew that if there was a discrepancy between the HD ones and the LTEC stacks, the HD ones were right. Mm. Oh, wow. Go with that direction. If they're not agreeing, chances are your car is going to agree much more with the HD ones than it is the huge. Stack. Oh, wow. And those HD ones go all the way down, man. It's like, I can't think of a near field monitor that has as much low end as those. Yeah. And I, and I have a sub it's, it, you know, it's not really turned up very loud, but, uh, it, it, it is kind of essential to know what's going on way down there because mix engineers still like 
uh, Yamaha NS10s sometimes uh, or something <laughs> like that. But uh, I just don't get, and no, they don't get the right low end. They don't get the right focus point. You know, to them, boosting 40 hertz is the same as boosting 50 hertz, probably the same as boosting 60 hertz from what they're hearing on a set of what I call right. low frequency challenged monitors. Uh, it's all the same. It's all just making that, that cone pop out, but they can't really focus it at the right frequency. Uh, Are you using another be? set of near fields as well? Like uh, an R tone or anything? Just the no, Myers? No, I mean, I do listen in my car still. Um, I'm not really a big fan of voicing mastering on a laptop or an iPhone. I know that the vast majority of listeners out there, that's what they're listening on. Mm -hmm. But people who listen on an iPhone, are, are they really audiophiles? Or are they just looking to make some noise? To I some listen screen? nonstop on iPhone because I'm lazy. People send me stuff and I'm just like, I always have to say, hey, I'm listening on an iPhone, so I'm not going to comment on the mix. But I, I can walk down to my studio at any time and listen to it in a good environment. And I just won't do it because it's 300 feet that way, you know, so I'm nonstop on my iPhone. I'm like the worst of the worst in regards to that. <laughs> a quick question here on um, on on levels. OK, so, you know. When we're printing masters now, it's like, okay, we're not in the finite world of containers. So we can, you know, we have all these algorithms, you know, are you still printing hot, hot, hot mixes? Are you doing it, that thing where it's it all, laying up at the top? It all depends on what is the um, ultimate medium for what I'm doing. For people that only have the budget to do one mastering, I am still doing things that we, what we would call CD level, but I was never the loudest in the, in the, in the level wars. Um, there is that point of distortion that I just can't, no, 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 you know, it becomes unmusical at a certain point. Um, so I was never the loudest guy out there, but there are still, the, the loudness wars aren't quite over and people are not quite embracing having a separate mastering yet for streaming and vinyl. But in a perfect world, that's what I would do, is I would have um, a less peak-limited version available for vinyl and for streaming because we know that for every dB that I turn it up, Spotify is going to turn it down. So I have been spending a lot of time at a website called loudnesspenalty.com. <laughs> this is where he takes off his shirt and he's got it tattooed across his back like <laughs> Golden Palace. Okay. Um, you know, it's a great resource for being able to, to drag and drop that? File and say, okay, Spotify is going to turn this down. A, a client sent me a mix that for mastering. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was his reference that he gave his, his clients. And Spotify was going to turn it down 8 dB. That's a, that's a lot. If you're All right. Only so I was, I'm sorry. Minutes. I'm sorry. Stop. You have to go back because I was talking over you. Tell us a, what this is. This this is this website will tell you how much your file is going to get turned down. Is right, that what so you're you saying? Can, you can drag and drop a file for free, uh -huh. and it will generate the offsets that all the streaming platforms are going to oh. use: YouTube, Spotify. Is the goal uh, to get as close to zero? Like that's the goal. I don't think the goal is to get it as close to zero, because I notice that changing peak limiting, changing compression, does change balances in the mix. But, you know, knowing that Spotify is going to take your mix and, and turn it down 8 dB. It's uh, a big drop. That, that's a, you know, that, that's a lot. You know, chances are I would have chosen to print it at least 2 dB lower than that. Which is the whole world at that level. Yeah. Like you get everything back that you're sacrificing. If you're trying to get level, you turn it down 2 dB. You've got all that back usually. You get that, you get that more of that point on the kick drum. You know, because you're not over peak limiting. And like that you, haze, I mean, it gets so, it gets so, for lack of a better <laughs> descriptor, you know, yeah. it's just this, it sounds like it's sizzling, literally sizzling. Yeah. You know, the, the image, everything about it. So, okay. So when you're doing a master, let's say for streaming, are you printing the final master at zero? Or are you leaving 
headroom for intersample clipping when they derive MP3 and M- different resolution files? I keep asking like clients when I, you know, I, I've been hanging out more at Spotify as well. What sounds good on Spotify? And when I hear something good, you know, inquiring where I have the option as far as, okay, what, what did you supply for them? And I find that the vast majority of things that are still being sent are at CD level. Okay. So, so demystify this for me. This is what I, I was watching a, uh, a YouTube thing. They say, Hey, you print your wave file. You don't have any distortion. It's at zero and it's fine. But whenever you go ahead and print an MP3, depending on the resolution of the MP3, you'll have what's called intersample clipping, which means that by the, generating the master or the generating the mp3 file it will generate some distortion that's not there but it gets this aggregate in this clipping happens because you're paring it down and sort of you're you're putting it through a wrapper you know a codec and yes. that at that point it, it will generate distortion in your mix so my question is like oh what should we be doing? Should we always be leaving a half a dB, three tenths of a dB, seven tenths of a dB? Should we be leaving some headroom so that whenever files do get generated, low resolution MP3 files, should we leave some headroom there for that intersample clipping or is that not valid? Spotify has a whole paragraph and a half of their best practices on what you should submit to them. And they say that you should always leave at least two dB of headroom. Oh, wow. So peaks at minus two. But nobody does that. Nobody does that. Nobody does that, which is why I, you know, am back hanging out at at, uh, loudnesspenalty.com and just trying to get something that's not uh, not crazy. You know, if if, I want them to turn it down some, because if somewhere in the process they fail and they don't turn it down at all, woohoo, I won the level war. Um, I, I, I actually, I printed a hip hop track and loudnesspenalty.com said that it was, it, it was only going to be turned down one DB, but it was the loudest thing I had mastered all year. So the whole Luff's scale has flaws in it. Every, every, every metering scale has its flaws. So the fact that it was basically just kick drum and vocal. Uh, it it got through their computer analysis oh. and and uh, you know allowed me to print the loudest thing I had printed all year. Um, level is such a mind fuck, you know. It it, it is uh, psychoacoustically in, enticing. I I remember doing a session with a, a producer Hugh Padgham, and the A uh, and R person on the project had sent a dat to the mastering session. I was not mastering. I was only the editor. Uh, but he got to come into my studio and we were referencing the, the a r person said, you should master off of this dat. It sounds way better than the master you gave me. And of course, you know, he was like, hmm, how could that be? And so, you know, we, we listened to that one song probably for uh, 45 minutes. And the first time through, we listened to it and we're like, wow, yeah, you know, compared to that other dad, this dad seems to have more bottom. And we'd listen through again. Yeah, it's got more bottom, but it's also got more top. And, and you know, so we go through it multiple times. It's got more mid, too. And it turned out that as soon as we raised the level a dB and a half on his master, they sounded identical. They had taken his master... Funny put it through a console and raised it. But see a DB and a half is not enough yeah. for your ear to go. That's just freaking louder, but it is enough for you, you to go. If, as long as there's no digital artifacts, your ear right. will go, wow, that one is fuller. That one, you know, leaps off of the player. That one, uh, you know, yeah, moves more, but really it was just louder. And really that's the entire basis of the level wars, which has ex- uh, existed into the vinyl days. One of the reasons that so uh, I, I'm not going to be able to narrow you down to an answer because I don't, I don't, I don't know that there is one. Like I, I'm desperate as a mix engineer to know like, Hey, is it worth me leaving seven tenths of a DB for them to generate MP3s from later? 
You know, is it worth it or is it not worth it? I, I don't know that well, to master know from or to no, like final printed master that you would then generate MP3s off of, so it would have the headroom to not intersample clip. Is my you know thought like that's what people I hear conversations about that, and I'm wondering like is that a thing that I should be doing, or is it going to get crispy if I put it up at zero? It's the wave file will all be fine stored at zero or stored at minus seven point seven, not minus zero point seven. But when you generate the MP3s, depending on the resolution of the MP3, as you go lower, there's going to be more intersample clipping. Clipping, you're going to need more headroom to generate a file without distortion. And I guess uh, I guess I can't find a good answer. Like even this podcast, I print at minus point three or point five. I just print it because I know it's going to be going to an MP4. You know, mm-hmm. I wish I could get. Um, and you say like Spotify has best practices, but I think. I'd rather listen to Andy Van Dett. I'd rather listen to George Massenberg. You know, it's like, what is, what is the answer to that? It doesn't seem like we have one. Um, I would say use a peak limiter that has true peak in it. So, uh, that you know, something that just takes a distorted signal and, and turns it down two tenths of a dB is not the same as something that has a true peak built into it that's going to figure out that minus two is minus two or minus point two um, for you. And I know that as soon as I started using that is when I stopped getting these calls. Uh, I used to live in fear of the client calling me up and hearing distortion where I didn't. Mm-hmm. And generally I thought that they were taking my wave files, sticking them on their iPhone, which encoded them, by default into AAC files and then having this overshoot from, you know, reconstituting or, or data compressing. Can you tell me what a true peak limiter is? I, I, I would have to look that up, Joe. (laughs) But is it like a, like what is an L2 is maximum is like, is that, is that a term when you say true peak, is that like a, a generation or a technology of limiter? I am not sure. Like I said, I'd have to, I'd have to look what would it up. You, what's the name of, do you have a name of one that you use that you would call a true peak limiter? Yeah, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> Get out there and listen to all the, listen to all of them. You're a jerk. And, uh, own them all like I do. And, uh, but is true know. peak an actual technology or is true peak something you're just using to call something like a really great brick wall limiter? <sighs> I'm not sure if it's an industry-wide thing. Or... Okay, I'd like to know more about it. I'd like to. I really want to do this because I recently did a record, and I put the L2 on it. And when I do my records, what I use 99% of the time is I use my L2 or maximum, maximum or ozone or whatever peak limiter I'm using. I put it on and I bring it down, and then I just use it to store higher. Use the full spectrum, you know, the full mm-hmm. scale. So I'll let it just touch a 10th of a dB and then I'll raise it a 10th of a dB. So I'm just using it as a ceiling to make sure that my peaks are up at zero. I'm not using it to limit. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Sure. Okay. So I use it to make sure that my, I'm storing my data using the full, full scale. Um, But I did notice that when I start listening between them, drastically different. Yes. That's why I'm saying, listen, set to the same (laughs) settings. I don't want, I don't want to listen. I want you to tell me. (laughs) <laughs> no i'm telling I, you buy I get the ball, it. listen I get to the it, ball yeah. and you know there are what are some of your favorites for them all um, what are some of your favorites give us a i give love us... them all wow <laughs> <laughs> secrets <laughs> okay i get it i get it <laughs> joe joe west is the person that i i i told too much to <laughs> And you told me to stay in Pittsburgh and get a, get a job in the um, steel mills. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, dude. I appreciate you coming on and sharing some of your insight with you. You know, I, I like that, you know, I, we did get a bit into the tech, but, you know, we need to realize the real important thing here is get your mind straight and what your mission statement is, why you're in any business and trying to be a, a great part, a necessary block in something that's really special. Um, you've done that continually. Every time I worked with you or, refer somebody to you it's like they leave feeling like you were part of the band so thank you for being that way and pointing out that the some of the success stuff is in the career over 30 years isn't 
isn't always twisting the knobs. It's a lot of being the right guy for the right job. I would like to leave your listeners with uh, just a little bit of wisdom that of the gigs that I inherited from another mastering engineer after a client pulled it, I got it because they did too much. They overprocessed. Mm. And of the gigs that I have lost to other mastering engineers, it's because I overprocessed mm. and didn't listen hard enough to what they were giving me and, and didn't listen hard enough in finding why did they feel that this was ready for mastering? Um, so mastering very much is the game of less is more. You, so, you know, it's funny you say that, man. You know, I've been in mixing. I've been trying to <laughs> up my game as a mixer. And we've had all these legends on. And all of these guys talk about how little they do. You know, and when they record, they move the mics before they reach free cues and they compressors and stuff like that. I've noticed my stuff sounds so much better doing less. And and Frank Filippetti had talked about using um, the faders as EQ. You make something louder, it gets brighter. It's so true. Back, it gets darker. And it's like, I've been really trying to do that. The same yeah. idea you're talking about. Everything I over-processed in my mix, they all sound like shit. This is sounding so much better by using less. It's so yeah. interesting you're saying that. That's funny. It's so funny because 100% true until it's not true. Yeah. Well, and then it's too. like, and then it's like you got to bake it so hard to do something that was like, holy cow, that was in there. So it's the aggregate of when you get to talk to these guys who have been doing it for 30 years. It's the aggregate of watching people learning, experimenting, you know, learning every day. Ellis Shiner was saying he learns every day. You know, what? and if, if he can learn every day, I can learn every day. And if you legitimately are in, in for the best part of that record, like wanting the best for it, like you're sending it off to college and trying to get it to be able to afford a mortgage one day, if you care for it like you'd care for a child, well, then you'll do those extraordinary steps. And it, sometimes it requires a sledgehammer. Sometimes it requires you to move, push yourself away from the console, <laughs> kick the console over, you know, put down the console, kick it over to me, you know, don't touch the knobs. That's the beauty of this art. And we're trying to demystify it. And, it is sometimes a sledgehammer, sometimes a crochet needle, you know, yeah. it's a, it's, it, that's what's so great about it is it's still vexing after 30 years. So it's still something you fit. Every time you pick it up, you're figuring it out. Every time you get a file in, it's like, how do I hear this for the first time with all the experience I have bringing it to the table? Beautiful thing we get to be a part of. Uh, we thank you for hanging out with us. Where can people find you? Well, my website is andyvandette.com, A-N-D-Y-V-A-N-D-E-T-T-E.com. Um, I am all over Facebook, during on Facebook, which is generally probably my most active, you know, whatever I'm working on. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of little videos of me cutting vinyl um, and the like. Uh, and um, yeah, andyvandette.com. Also, andy at andyvandette.com is my email. Awesome. Cool. And um, so we'll put the links down for Facebook and for your website and your email address down in the description for this. Hey, folks, remember, we do do this as a regular podcast if you're listening on Spot uh, Spotify or iTunes, but it's also on YouTube. And um, if if you see that maybe there's some content that you didn't get on a Tuesday, like this Tuesday, the, the Facebook or the um, podcast feed was blank because we had done a release that was more visual. We do some studio tours. So check out the YouTube page uh, from the West Barn podcast and you'll be able to see, we just did a studio tour with Tony Mora. So some things are more visual and live on that medium. Uh, we appreciate you coming on, buddy. Uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. And if you feel like telling us about the peak limiters you can you know we'll put it in as an addendum i know you're gonna feel guilty if you if you hang up but thanks pal thank you for having me right. that's it this week for the west barn thank you all signing off we'll see you next time